So it's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day, Anaïs Bordeaux from the Ex-Marseille University in the CNRS in the Marseille Medical Genetics Unit and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Anaïs did her PhD in bioinformatics in Marseille, um, finished that in, in 2007, and then was a postdoc with Alfonso Valencia at the Spanish National Center uh, for Cancer Research in Madrid. And in 2010, she, jo she joined Marseille, the Marseille Mathematics Institute. And in, in there in Marseille, uh, she then moved 2017 to the Marseille Medical Genetics Unit, MMG, to create a group for networks and systems biology for diseases. And that's also the a major focus in her, her research. Since 2019, she's also an associate researcher in the life sciences at, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So her main research interest, as, as I already alluded to, is to develop computational approaches to study human diseases with a particular focus on network-based methods. We are very happy to have you here, Anais. This is a very exciting and, and relevant topic and to learn more. Um, we, we are also very happy to learn more about your research now in the next hour. The floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And um, I've seen that you have had a fantastic line of, of speakers. So it's really exciting to be to be in this context and to discuss with you. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about the work we are doing in, in the team in the Marseille Medical Genetics Unit, and it's overall dedicated to multiomics data integration for genetic uh, diseases. So the context of this work is um, that we have a lot of biological uh, data today. And I will focus today mainly on, on omics data. So the different types of omics data we have access to. And these data, they are really diverse, meaning we can have transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, intractomics, and so on and so, so forth. And in addition, all these data sets, they are very large. Uh, very large, mainly when we speak about the number of biological variables, much more than the number of samples, which is quite often a problem. And all these data are also very complex, that for instance, they are not independent um, from each other. So overall, we really do need, and this is currently a bottleneck, we really do need computational methods for the analysis and extracting knowledge from, from all these biological data independently, but also jointly together. And why? Because we really want to integrate the information from the different types of data. And why do we want to do that? Um, because the integration of different uh, omics data is really essential for the first reason is that each omics data, they, they have their own bias and limitation and noise. And integrating different data sets is expected to reduce this noise. And in addition, all the different data sets, they capture different aspects or scale of cellular functioning. So they will complement each other to provide a more comprehensive view of the cellular mechanisms and all their pathological deregulations in which we are interested in uh, here. So we really do need computational methods for the analysis of omics data, but we also need these methods for the integration of different types of data. And this is exactly what uh, I want to talk about. And this is the, the let's say, main goals of the, the projects we are trying to develop in, in my team in Marseille. And we have really two aspects. So starting from biomedical omics data, we want to do new algorithms for the integration of different types of data that can be used in, in different contexts. But we want also to apply the, these algorithms to study uh, genetic diseases. And we're interested in genetic diseases in, in, in general, but more particularly in rare diseases, in rare genetic diseases. And I want to state here that these rare genetic diseases are really um, bringing some scientific challenges that are worth uh, studying. So first, rare diseases are rare, but we have many different rare diseases. So together, for instance, in, Fr in France, you have more than 6,000 rare diseases, and, and together it's 3 million patients. So it's more patient than cancer. Then many patients remain uh, undiagnosed. Like we have some diagnosis for less than half percent of the patients. So it's called diagnosis wandering or diagnosis deadlock. Um, also, the phenotype are highly heterogeneous. So we, we have sometimes the feeling that uh, rare disease, they are often monogenic caused by mutation in one gene. And so as opposition to 
complex diseases such as cancer or Alzheimer's, they can look as simple disease, but it's not the case. They are very, very complex. The phenotypes in different patients can be highly heterogeneous, even if you have mutation in the same genes. And in many cases, we do not have a clear picture of the pathophysiological mechanisms. What are the cellular deregulations that are happening? And of course, in most cases, no treatment exists. So a rationale is that the integration of different omics data sets and this type of large-scale omics studies, they are also very important and very relevant for rare genetic diseases. And that if that this met, these diseases would need specific methods because they, we have very few patients and some specific challenges. So we really do want to, to develop methods, but having in mind that we want to apply these methods to study rare genetic diseases. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about three different stories um, that represent three different frameworks for omics data integration that we have been working on. This framework are the mining of multi-layer networks. So we will focus here on interaction networks. Then the, the active module identification, which is an approach to integrate quantitative data such as transcriptomics gene expression onto a network and try to find subnetworks of interest. And finally, we will leave the, the word of networks to uh, talk about joint dimensionality rejection, which are other approaches very interesting to integrate uh, different types of omics data. And for each of these uh, framework, I will try to show you some of the algorithms we, we are developing and also how we try to apply them to better understand rare genetic diseases. So the first framework is the mining of multi-layer networks. And I will start by thanking the people who did this work and this algorithm, uh, who are Alberto Valde Olivas and Anthony Batista, two PhD students, and Leo Pio Lopez and Osana Nesishik, two postdoctoral um, fellows. And this work was in collaboration with the Mathematic Institute in Marseille, so with a strong involvement of people more from the theoretical side. Uh, okay, so we're interested in mining large-scale networks. What is a large-scale network? It's, it's this kind of picture. You have a huge set of interactions between nodes of interest. And historically, these large-scale intractome networks were mainly protein-protein interaction networks in which the nodes correspond to the proteins and the edges to their physical relationships. So it's true that um, these networks were quite criticized at the beginning because they contain some false positives, but the techniques evolved a lot. Uh, it's true also that they do not have any spatial temporal context, meaning that we know that there can be a physical binding in between two nodes, but we don't know if they are expressed at the same time in the same place. But still, all these networks, if you consider the, the amount of interaction, they contain a lot of information and knowledge about protein cellular functioning. And even for proteins that are poorly st studied. So you can have interaction profiles thanks to large scale interactome mapping techniques. So my, my claim is that they, they are worth studying because they contain a huge knowledge about cellular functioning. And what is interesting is that we do not have only these protein-protein interaction networks nowadays because we have access to many different interaction sources. So the protein-protein interaction network can be complemented by a molecular complex network in which the interactions are drawn from immunoprecipitation experiments, for instance. But you can also fetch data in, in pathway databases such as Reactom or KEG and construct big networks of pathway relationships like this one. And importantly, we also have uh, now a lot of other types of omics from which we can build network or infer networks. For instance, here, it's a network of correlation of expression constructed from RNA-seq expression data in many cell lines and tissues, and you just compute the correlation of expression. And, and this can be done with different and more advanced statistical techniques, but it, it can be also be done with many different types of omics. So we have all these different interaction sources, which uh, overall contain a huge quantity of information about gene and protein cellular function. However, these networks, they are, they are large, they are complex and noisy. And, and the big question is how do we extract this information? And it's what we are trying to do uh, with algorithms based on graph theory, and we are trying to do that by considering the different interaction network sources jointly. 
uh, to, to try to extract knowledge. And we do that by using what is called a multiplex framework. Okay, I will define what is a multiplex network now. So a multiplex network is um, a network composed of different layers. And here are represented the different layers. Each layer contains the interaction from one category, for instance, molecular complexes and pathways, but all the layers, they do contain exactly the same nodes. So I do have exactly the same nodes, which are gene or proteins that are considered here uh, the same. So what is interesting by, by combining this or uh, setting a multiplex framework is that you will keep track of the individual network topologies and features. And I will try to show that. So once we have this multiplex framework, we want to do classical network analysis uh, approach. For instance, the first one is identify communities. Communities are, are groups of proteins or nodes that share a lot of interactions and that are expected to, to be involved in the same biological processes or cellular function. But how do we do that from uh, multiple sources of interaction? So maybe the more um, intuitive way to say, okay, I will try to combine the different networks to have only one network and then apply my very classical uh, community identification algorithm. So for instance, we can compute the intersection, take only the interactions that are present in, in the different networks. So this would be very strong interactions because they have been found by different interaction sources. Uh, however, using the networks I presented before, I think there are less than six interactions that are common to the four big networks. So this does not work. Uh, another approach is to try to do identify communities independently in the different networks and then try to do consensus. And this does not always uh, work. And I think you had this notion also in the talk of uh, Chloe Agatha Asenkos with uh, late integration methods. Um, so because it's, it's quite often hard to find consensus. And the other possibility is to try to do the union or the sum of the different networks. And the problem, if you do that, is that you remember we had very big and noisy network, and you will hide all your relevant interactions from pathway or protein interaction in, inside this very big and noisy network. So this merging of the different networks also does not really work. So that's why we wanted to work using the multiplex framework. So keeping track of the individual um, network layers. And we developed uh, methods for clustering or community identification that can work directly from the multiplex network. So it optimizes the, the, the modularity, but it's a multiplex modularity and it allows identifying clusters from a multiplex network without merging and without doing any consensus. So what we have shown, so we, we use this method in different contexts and in particular in the dream challenge, uh, which was dedicated to the identification of communities uh, enriching disease genes. Uh, what we found is that we do obtain different uh, results than when we merge the networks together. Uh, in particular, we do not, when we merge the networks together, it's more or less like if we would use the big co-expression network on. Um, what we also have seen is that Using more interaction sources in many cases uh, provides better communities, meaning uh, richer communities that have more annotation and more uh, interpretability on cellular processes that uh, occur in the cell. However, there is a, a point of caution is that the, the different interaction sources must, must be complementary, meaning they should reflect the same biological process. And this does not always occur. So for instance, if you combine a protein-protein interaction and a pathway um, network, it's the same process, meaning they do reflect some physical contact and, and flow of information inside the cell. But if you do want to combine a protein-protein interaction and a, a network built from epistatic interaction, which often occur in between different pathways, they do not reflect the same process exactly. And the combination will not work in this case, okay? So this was the first algorithm I, I, I like a lot uh, dedicated to community identification. And I will not talk about a second uh, uh, algorithm I really enjoy, uh, which is called a random walk with restart algorithm. So it's an algorithm for uh, network exploration, which uh, works as, as this. So you start with a, 
what you call the seed, it's really the node you will be interested in. It could be uh, your gene mutated in a disease, your favorite protein, for instance, you have your seed. And then you simulate a random particle that is working into the inter interactome. So you start from the seed, I can go there or there. So let's say I'm going there. I'm at this point, I can move here, here, or here. So you are walking like that in the interactome. And this particular with restart random walk also has at each step a non-zero probability to go back to the seed. So you see that if you do simulate this process a lot, you, you are to seed and you will walk and you can restart and you will work and you can restart. You have some nodes because they are close to the seed and highly connected, they will be visited a lot. And other nodes which are far away and maybe less connected will be much less visited. So in a sense, it's a way, it's a very smart way to define a score of distance from all the nodes in the network to the seed. And so here it's a, just a toy model. You see that it's different from just computing the number of jumps. So this node and this node, they, have, they are at one jump to the seed, but this one has a better score because it's more connected. So it has more probability to be visited by the random worker. So the random work with restart define a score, a proximity distance score of all the network nodes with respect to the seed. Uh, here it's just a toy model. Do not forget that your seed is hidden in this big network. So you will have score for all the nodes here with respect to your seed. And what is also interesting is that you can have more than one seed. So you can have two seeds here, for instance. So you will have a score with respect to the two seeds. Um, this could be very useful to do what we call Gilba association. So to try to extract the subnetworks of interest around your seeds of interest. So here, the random worker uh, is anchored in, in three seeds, which are DNA repair uh, nodes, DNA repair gene proteins. And so the blue nodes are the closest uh, subnetwork extracted from the random walk, from the big network, but around these seeds. And we see that almost all the nodes here are also involved in DNA repair. So it's a really a guild by association strategy, but we have all the nodes that at least at the time in the annotation databases, they were, did not have the annotation DNA repair and it's a way to try to predict functions also for, for these nodes. Okay, so this was the state of the art uh, algorithm, the random work with restart is widely used in bioinformatics to do Gilba association on networks. And what we did is to extend this algorithm so it can navigate multiplex or multi-layer networks. So now the random worker can navigate one network, but it can also jump to another network and to another network. And it can jump because uh, remember in our definition of multiplex, we have the same nodes in the different layers. So here, our seed will be hidden in, in these big networks, but we have more than one networks, but same way we can define a score from all the network nodes with respect to the seed. And this is very useful. So it's implemented in, in, a, in a package and it's very useful because the, the output random work with restart scores, they can be used in a wide variety of application. They can be used directly for node prioritization or ranking also to extract subnetworks around seeds of interest, but they can also be used for other bioinformatics uh, input as input of other bioinformatics algorithms to do clustering or network embedding, for instance. Anais, may I ask a question here? Um, mm -hmm. On the previous slide, when you say you can you can jump to across layers, like how expensive is it to jump to a different layer? So this is a parameter. You can either say that you, you want to explore a bit more network and so give more probability to go to another node of the same network or give the same probability to go to, to a no, node of the same network or to jump to another layer. It's something you can, you can tune. Usually we do something homogeneous, like mm -hmm. we do the same, the same values to go everywhere. Um, although in some cases for real application, we try to lower the, the weight of the co-expression network, which we know are, is more, more noisy. And so we put a lower probability to jump to this network. So it's a hyperparameter that you mm -hmm. tune with some main knowledge. So, so Lucas, uh, Lucas also has a question. Sorry, a very quick follow-up question. But once you jump between two layers, when you're exploring a second layer, let's say, uh, is the algorithm allowed to jump again? Yeah. 
Yeah, at each time point, it can either restart, and the restart can also be in any layer uh, at the same weight, or it can be more in one layer, or explore, or move from one layer to another. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so my point here was that these cores are very useful because they are really versatile and you can use it in a wide variety of contexts. So I will show you uh, later different examples on how we use that for embedding, for instance. But now I want to show you an example on how we use that uh, to try to, to have uh, some insights on, on, a, on one rare disease one set of rare diseases, which are uh, muscular dystrophies. And we were interested, so muscular dystrophies are, are monogenic diseases caused by mutation in different genes that lead to weaknesses in muscles. And among all the muscular dystrophies, um, we were particularly interested in two sets of muscular dystrophies that have different, that affect different types of muscles. And it's really interesting because we have some muscular dystrophies that affect only uh, muscles of the distal part of the body. So it's distal onset myopathy, such as Bayoshi myopathy. And other myopathies in which the affected muscle are in the central part of the body, such as limb gabriel muscular dystrophy. And following or well, uh, fetching data from a gene panel, which is used for diagnosis, we've been able to identify 11 genes that when mutated only lead to distal um, myopathies and 19 that when mutated only lead to proximal myopathies. And we don't really understand that because it's all skeletal muscle. So we don't really have a clue on why uh, different sets of muscles should be affected. So what we did is we tried to do this Gilba association strategy uh, on networks using these genes and these genes as seeds. So we have three big networks, three big biological networks, pathway, protein-protein interactions, no, molecular complexes, protein-protein interactions, and pathways. And we use as seed either, either the 11 distal only genes or 11, either the 19 proximal only genes. And we extracted the top scoring subnetworks around these seeds. And what we found is that it, it's not the same subnetwork. Uh, so it's different genes, and it's not the same subnetwork that is extracted. And interestingly, this uh, first subnetwork with distal-only genes, it's, it's enriched in proteins localized in the sarcomere, which is the kind of cytoplasm of muscular cells. And this subnetwork is enriched in protein localized in the sarcolemma, uh, meaning it's the membrane of the muscular cells and also involved in O-glycosidation. So it means that it seems that these mutated genes that lead to different onsets are involved in different maybe functions of the muscular cells. And now we want to use that to, to use this knowledge to try to dig further in other types of myopathies, such as dyspherinopathies, in which this time the same mutated gene lead to the two different phenotypic onsets in different patients with the same mutated gene Half of the patients will have a distal myopathy and half of the patients will have a proximal myopathy, which is striking. And we want to use this, this knowledge and uh, exome data we have to try to find modifier genes in this disease. Okay, so this is an example of how we apply the random work strategy to do some guilt by association uh, in rare diseases. Okay, so all the networks I've been presenting so far are multiplex network, meaning they were sharing the same nodes. But we want to go beyond that. We want to integrate much net more networks and much more heterogeneous networks. So we want them to have different edges as before, but also different nodes, uh, not only genes or proteins. We want to integrate networks with uh, drugs, networks with diseases, for instance. We also want to uh, have networks that are weighted and directed and we want to integrate everything in a common framework, and we can do that with bipartite interactions. So I have my different uh, networks containing different nodes, and they are connected by bi bipartite interactions, meaning interactions in between two sets of nodes. So for instance, I can connect a gene network with a disease network because I know which gene is mutated in which disease. So it's another network connecting the two networks. I can also connect the compounds to the genes because the compounds, uh, we can know which drug target, which protein, for instance. So in a way, we, we know how this type of network, which are universal multilayer network, and we want to be able to explore them, which was not possible with the tools we had. So what we did first is to extend this 
this random walk uh, with restart algorithm I'm talking about, so they can navigate this type of universal multi-layer uh, networks. And th this was not easy. It's a bit tricky because we have a huge combination of networks and matrices and all the parameters to navigate between different layers of a given multiplex network, between different multiplex networks and so on and so, so forth. But we were able to do that, and Anthony managed to, to code that. And it's available in a package, in a Python package called uh, Multix Rank, that can explore uh, these very generic uh, multi layer networks. Uh, so we are very happy with that. We want to apply it to different contexts, but we had to do some tests first. Like when you develop a new tool in bioinformatics, you, you have to do some evaluation. And the first one, is that you see here, and it's related to, to your questions, that we have a huge number of possible parameters and we want to know what are their impacts. So the first test we did was to try to explore the parameter space. And for that, um, we use a combination of two multiplex network and a uh, monoplex is a simple network. So we have the gene multiplex network, which correspond to the networks I'm talking about from the beginning, we have protein-protein interaction, pathway interactions, and, and molecular complex interactions. We have a drug multiplex network with different uh, layers of interactions in between uh, drugs, so molecular compounds. And these different interactions are, for instance, the fact that they can be involved, in, uh, they can create the same secondary effects and these kind of relationships. And we have a disease network. So here it's a monoplex. It's, um, the, the diseases are connected by their phenotypic similarities. And all these three networks are connected together with bipartite interactions. The genes are connected to the disease, the disease are connected to the drug, the disease are connected to the genes. I said that, and the genes are connected to the drugs. Uh, we use one node, random node as a seed, and we tested over 100 parameters uh, sets to try to see what are the output scores and how they behave. And what we observed is that, so this is a principal component analysis of the output scores in this hundred sets of, using this hundred set of parameters. What we observe is that indeed changing the parameters will affect the, the output scores, but we have some zones of stability where all the outputs are more or less the same, even if we change the parameter set. Uh, okay, so this was the, the observation of that. And now we wanted to test, to evaluate the approach in, in, in its final goal of guild by association uh, in, in bioinformatics mainly. So for that, we devised two different strategies, an unsupervised strategy and a supervised uh, one. So in the unsupervised strategy, it's a leave one out cross validation. What we do is uh, we pretend we don't know the association in between one gene and one disease. So we left out the gene and we pretend we don't know the, uh, the, the association. And we use the disease as a seed in the random work with restart algorithm. And we check what is the rank of the left out gene using the disease as a seed. So for instance, if we use only the protein-protein interaction, we have about 20% of the left out genes that are ranked in the top 100 of the better scores of the random work with restart. If we use the gene multiplex network, so composed of the three layers I was mentioning, uh, we increase about to, to about 40%. And the best result is obtained when we use the gene multiplex plus the disease monoplex network together. And this is a bit striking that when we use the, all the networks together, the gene plus the disease plus the drug, we have indeed decrease a bit the performance. So it seems that the drug networks do not bring a lot of signal to predict the associations in between gene and diseases. And in fact, we retrieve the same observation using a supervised uh, classification for the evaluation. So here it's a kind of historical validation. What we did is we trained a random forest classifier uh, that was trained on a network containing gene disease association from DisGenet. DisGenet is a gene disease association database. We use the version two for the training. The version two is 2014. And for the testing of the classifier, we use the Genet version seven, it's 2020. So in fact, we are trying to see if uh, the random forest trained on, on a network built from old 
gene disease association, is able to predict the gene disease association that, that were published after. And we see that the F1 score of this approach is again better if we use only the gene and the disease multiplex network. If we add the drug multiplex network, we lower the score. So we, we retrieve the result that the drug multiplex network is not bringing a lot of signal in, the, in this context. Okay, uh, But in any case, if we use only these two networks, uh, we, we're, we're quite happy to see that the classifier is able to predict new gene disease associations. Okay. Um, just uh, mention also uh, about uh, network embedding, which is a really trendy topics in network si topic in network science. So um, the, the idea of the embedding is, is really in the spirit of the dimensionality rejection we hear a lot about. Uh, the idea is to project your network data into a low dimensional space. Uh, and then you can use this low dimensional space for many different applications like cluster identification or directly machine learning classifiers. So it, it's quite convenient to have this low dimensional representation. It's not easy to represent graph data in a low dimensional space. So they have diff different approaches for that. And we try to, to propose a new solution to do that, but with a multiplex network as input. Um, so this is a called uh, Multiverse. It's a network embedding for multiplex networks. So you start with a multiplex network and you can also do multiplex heterogeneous. So it means you have a multiplex network connected to one other type of network, not a full universal network, but connection with one heterogeneous network. And we use the, the random work with restart scores to uh, have a similarity matrix that we can use then to do the embedding. And we tested the embedding and this approach on different classical tests uh, for this type of tools, like clustering, link prediction, load labeling, and so on. And now we want to implement that with the universal random work with research strategy. And we also have, uh, we would also like to compare what is really the added value of the embedding as compared to directly using the scores computed in the network. So we have different projects ongoing on that. And with that, I, I finished what I wanted to talk about uh, on, on the mining of multi-layer networks. And I will jump to my second part, which in this, we, we still have networks, but we try to integrate quantitative data on the nodes of these networks to try to fetch, uh, to fish the interesting subnetworks uh, from the big and large scale networks. So this is the work of uh, Elva Novoa, who is now a postdoc in Toulouse. Um, so here is the objectives, and it's the objective of the field of bioinformatics, which is dedicated to active module identification. Um, what you want to do is you have a biological network, and you want to, you want to integrate this biological network with RNA-seq transcriptomics data, for instance, uh, patient versus control differential expression analysis, to try to find subnetworks of interest, also known as active modules. So you really seek such subnetworks where you have a lot of differentially expressed genes in the subnetworks. And it's interesting because then you have access to, to the function that is deregulated, to the biological process that is deregulated. And this is uh, not an easy task uh, because finding, checking all the combination in the big network is, is impossible. So there have been many different algorithms to try to do that over the years. A famous one include um, a pineapple set, which is based on a greedy search or G-active module, which is based on simulated annealing. Um, and we, when we reviewed these different uh, methods, what we, we found is that um, few of these methods consider the density of interactions, meaning they try to find that the subnetwork, the output subnetwork is connected, but they do not, do not try to find subnetwork that will be like communities sharing more interactions in between them than with the rest of the network. Um, in addition, all the methods were usually using only protein-protein interaction networks, and they, have, they were not tested on RNA-seq data because the paper are 15 years old. So we tried to, we, meaning we propose a new solution and this new solution uses a multi-objective genetic algorithm, which are very uh, fancy algorithms that I wanted also to, to show you. So I will guide you through a genetic algorithm protocol. So in this type of algorithm, you start with an initial random population of solutions. In your case, a solution is a subnetwork. 
So we fed, so we, we gather random subnetworks from the big network. Then you will rank this population of subnetwork according to uh, your scoring system. So in our case, I told you we have a multi-objective. So in fact, we will have two objectives, two functions to optimize. I will show you uh, next slide. Once you have ranked the population, you choose the parents and you create the children from the parents. And you do that by combining two parents. So I have parent one and parent two. I have a constraint that they need to share one node and I will shuffle the different parents to create two children for, by crossover. And then I will also introduce some mutation, meaning adding um, nodes or removing nodes. Uh, so this will create a new population of children. So you will have a population of twice the initial number, and you will rank again this new population of parent and children using the same two objective function I will detail. And then you select your new population by elitism, you choose your best solution. And you do that again. You do select the parents, create the children, rank again, select, and, and so on and so forth until you reach your stopping criteria, which could be a number of generations. And if you do that, you should small pieces by small pieces try to find, meaning explore the full network and try to find the best solutions. So everything here is based on this ranking of the population. Um, so in our case, it's, it's a multi-objective genetic algorithm, and we do have two objectives to optimize. The first one is the average node score, meaning it's the amount of differential expression on the nodes of the subnetwork. So we compute that with this average node score. And our second objective is to try to uh, optimize the density of interaction. We want to have active modules that contain a lot of interactions. So we do that by optimizing the normalized density, which is a simple density of interaction but computed over different uh, networks, okay? So I compute these two scores. Uh, we compute these two scores and then we have to rank the population according to these two scores. And as we have two scores, uh, we, we need to have this way of uh, ranking the population and it's using the Pareto dominance. The idea is that if you plot here the density of interaction, so my uh, second objective, and here the differential expression, my first objective, each dot here represents a solution, one subnetwork. And the, par the Pareto front are organized, like in the first Pareto front, you have no other solution that could be better on the two objectives. So for instance, if I take this solution here, I cannot find any other solution that would be better both on differential expression and density of interaction. So this would be the first Pareto front and doing so you can define the second Pareto front, third Pareto front and so on. And this is uh, the way we use and we rank our solutions. So we use that to small, by, small pieces by small pieces, increase the quality of our solutions and select the parents and select the new population. And at the end of the day, the algorithm will output, the output of the algorithm will be the final first Pareto front and will be the set of subnetworks that are in this first Pareto front. So for instance, this one, which is a good trade-off in between a differential expression and density of interaction. But I'm also interested in this solution here, which is not so good in differential expression, but very good in interaction. And this solution here, which is very good in differential expression, but not so good in density. So the, the algorithm would give me this set of modules as a result. So we implemented that in the tool called uh, Mogamun. And then we had, as I said before, meaning when you do a new bioinformatics algorithm, you have to try to compare with existing approaches. So we, we set up a benchmark to try to compare our Mogamon approach uh, to state-of-the-art methods, which are cosine, which is also based on a genetic algorithm, but only with one objective, pinnacle set and G-active module. So to test the method, we simulated, uh, so we use a benchmark from uh, Batra et al. 2017, and we have one network and we select a subnetwork of 20 genes, which will be called foreground genes. And we simulate or we use artificial expression data to highlight, to give differential expression to these foreground genes. And then, so we had different scenario. I will not detail that, but then we try to see how good the different methods are to highlight these 20 uh, foreground genes. 
this benchmark is quite limited for different reasons. The first one is that it does not simulate the fact that it is it should be the foreground genes should be in a dense region. It just simulates the fact that they should be connected. It does not consider multiplex network and it consider only one community to be retrieved, only one set of foreground genes. Uh, but we had to do that because the other methods, we are not able to use multiplex network, find more, more than one community and, and this kind of uh, specificity that we implemented. So the results looked like that. Uh, so these are our two uh, objectives and, and each dot represents a solution from the different methods. Uh, what we found is that Pinnacle set found, finds a lot of different modules, some of which have a very good value for density and, and average node score. But if we focus on the subnetwork containing at least 15 nodes, everything disappears. So in fact, Pinnacle sets finds a lot of very small solutions. So in many cases, it's only two nodes. So two nodes, one edge is a maximum density. So they are looking good, but it's hard to interpret from a biological point of view. And um, on the contrary, for G active module and cosine, uh, they found very big network. So in some cases, it's eight, eight, 800, 1,000 nodes, also very difficult to interpret. And our approach was able to find sets of modules which were more reasonable, meaning they contain 15 to 20 nodes, and you can easily go back and discuss with biologists to interpret that. Um, so of course here it's two or two objectives. So it's a bit biased toward our methods, but we also computed the F1 score to see if the methods were able to retrieve the foreground genes. And Mogamun was giving a good trade-off because it was not too small and not too big. Um, so we applied this approach in collaboration with, with uh, uh, our colleagues uh, in this specific disease, which is called facios capillohumeral dystrophy. And which is a very complex disease because it's caused by hypomethylation of a specific genomic region. So it's not one mutated gene. And the consequences of this hypomethylation are already poorly described. So our colleagues, they have, uh, uh, they, they conducted the rna study in muscle fibers derived from um, stem cells, themselves derived from patients. So we have this rna data in patients and control. So we have the differential expression. And we combine it with molecular networks and, and run Mogamun, and we obtain, uh, I don't remember, 10 to 20 different active modules, such as this one. And so it was easy then to go back and discuss with them, and, and they were able to pick up the modules, the function they recognize or they were interested in. And in particular, here they identify many different genes involved in uh, the regulation of the calcium uptake by cells. And so what they did is they, they do some live imaging on this muscle of fibers to uh, monitor the calcium fluxes uh, in contracting cells. And they validated a done regulation of this process. So we are now continuing this, uh, the application of Mogamon in different contexts. The, the idea here is that we, we, we extract or we help finding biological processes that are perturbed in uh, rna data in a way. Okay, so this was my second story on active module identification. And now we will leave just for a moment the, the word of networks to go to joint dimensionality rejection because I think this approach are really complementary to the one I presented before. And this is the work done by Laura Cantini, my, my fellow uh, CNRS fellow in, in uh, Paris uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. So here in the context, it's a bit different. We have multiomics data but multiomics data are represented as matrices and that are obtained on the same samples. So for instance, I, have, I can have samples with transcriptome, copy number, microRNA methylation. So we have these different omics matrices and joint dimensionality rejection approaches are a set of approach we, here again, it's not neither late, neither early integration. Is that at the same time in the middle, they try to find the joint signal uh, by applying dimensionality reduction. And we focused here on approach based on matrix factorization, where the idea is to factorize each omic matrix in one omic specific matrix and a common factor matrix. So you do that, you will have this common factor matrix, which is common to the different omics. And then you can use this matrix to do sample clustering. And you can also use this approach to find some pathway processes and, and so on. So it's really interesting because here, 
the signal is really driven by the different omics together. Um, however, th there are many mathematical formulation to do this matrix factorization. So what we did is, is a large benchmark on, on joint matrix factorization approaches. So joint dimensionality reduction approaches based on matrix factorization. We used uh, nine different methods and we implemented three different benchmarks on simulated data, on cancer data and on single cell data. And we evaluated the performances of the methods to uh, find good clusters to associate factors with survival, metadata, biological annotations. Um, everything is implemented in a Jupyter notebook. So it means that if you develop a new method, you can directly plug it there and, and apply the three different benchmark on your methods and compare it with other methods. But also if you have a multi-omics data set, you can plug it there and apply all the different methods to your own multi-omics data set. Um, and the results of this study was that if you do want to do um, clustering, you're sure you want to do clustering analysis on your multi-omics data set, then the methods just, such as iCluster, which are really dedicated to clustering, perform very well. If you don't really know what you want to do, maybe you want to do a bit of clustering, but maybe also some survival analysis and finding enrichment in biological processes, then you should use MCIA, which was very versatile and, and quite good in many different contexts, including single cell analysis. Um, the word of conclusion for that is that these methods, they are very good, but they are really data intensive. So they require a lot of samples to, to work correctly. So how do we apply these methods uh, in rare diseases? And right now we cannot. So this is why it's a blank slide. And in fact, it's the future project of the team. And we really would like to try to have some approaches where we can apply multiomics integration with matrix factorization on rare diseases. And we will do that with uh, transfer learning strategies. So learning the factors on big compendium and then trying to project them on small samples. So this is relevant for rare disease, but it's also relevant when you want to do personalized or stratified medicine and you have few patients sharing similar profiles. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, I hope I convinced you that data integration is really important to better understand biological system, that it's not one omic will save everything. We really need these different points of view. Um, there are many different frameworks for data integration. I, I showed three different frameworks, but it's really dependent on what are your question, what you want to do, and you should find the framework that fits your data and not make the, the data fit your framework. Like if you do not have network or if it's hard to infer network, maybe it's better to go with a matrix-based framework and, and this kind of, of a strategy. And my final point is that more is not always better. So I, I, we show that with the drug network and, and you can also see that sometimes with different omics, you, you can do a lot of, you have to do a lot of uh, initial exploration and statistical exploration of your data set, trying to find their correlation to be sure that it's worth integrating everything. Um, so sometimes it's not the case and it's really depending on, on your question. So with that, I thank again all the team and I will take your questions. Thank you for this very exciting talk. Thanks a lot. Um, and I see here virtual applause coming in from the Zoom participants. Merci. And uh, Diane has a question. Please go first, um, Diane. Uh, hi. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a very basic question related to multiverse. Um, so multiplex networks are composed of several layers. And I didn't quite understand if multiverse is generating an embedding for each of the layer or only one for the entire multiplex. So it's generating one embedding for the entire multiplex. And okay. it's why it's interesting and why it's not an early or late integration, but really at the beginning is that the random walk are computed from the multiplex network. And so we have values for, for the nodes from the multiplex network. So you can have a joint embedding. Okay, I see. And would, would that work with each layer uh, being fully connected weighted uh, graphs? Where so currently, no, because it's, it's implemented on, on the first random walk with restart 
uh, we we had, but it's something we are trying we we are uh, in progress of doing. And uh, Anthony Battista is is trying to implement that using the universal random walk with restart. So this universal random walk with restart can navigate any combination of weighted directed layers. And when we will have plugged that with a, a multiverse optimization, the second step, then it will be able to work on any any multiplex network. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Anais. Uh, Giovanni is next. Hi, thank you for the very fascinating talk. Um, I have a quick question related to uh, the networks that you use for these analyses. Specifically, I wanted to ask, how does the quality of the networks you start with influence the results? What I mean is often many molecular networks or data that you can find is quite noisy. It's derived from experimental results, so you may have false positives or some uh, quality issues. My question is, combining networks like these would help to overcome the noise that comes from these uh, experimental challenges to find the molecular networks? Or would the algorithm suffer um, if one network with more noise is included? So this is a very important question indeed, because uh, we do not want to sum up the noise. We want to like subtract the noise somehow. Um, so we, we, we do not have any like gold standard network, but what we have shown, and in particular in the community identification algorithm, is that the fact of combining, finally, we try to en enhance the signal that is more present in more than one network. So it was filtering out the stuff that are only in one network, and in particular, the stuff that are only in this very big and noisy network. So for the community identification in particular, when we are at this step of multiplex modularity optimization, um, so it, it's a way of normalizing the modularity per network size. So it lowers the weight of the very big and noisy network. But I agree that it assumes that the very big network is the mo most noisy. Uh, then maybe a point more on protein-protein interactions, because it's true that uh, so the techniques for large scale to hybrid screens, it was uh, put on a large scale 20 years ago. And initially it was really full of false positives, but these data sets, they are better and better. And we do not have the same problems that were observed 20 years ago. And the data are quite, we can have good confidence on the data. It has been shown by comparing, so not by us, but by Mark Vidal and his team, um, that when they took as a gold standard interaction published in the literature by different uh, teams on a small scale, they, they show that they're, the new large scale to hybrid screen, they, they are quite good. And so I think here, combining these different sources of interaction, it, yeah, is really trying to extract the signal that is more everywhere. And so to fetch more good interactions. But of course, we, meaning at the end of the day, when we have a true result for something very important biologically, such as when we do that with the uh, uh, muscular dystrophies and before testing if this gene is really involved in this muscular dystrophy, of course, we check back the literature to, sh to try to see where this interaction is coming from. But as compared to 20 years ago, when I started my PhD, uh, when I do this check back of the literature, I have more and more often good interactions. <laughs> I see, thank you. Do you think, is there any way you could learn during the process the importance of the different networks? Or I, I could learn what? Sorry, I didn't hear. The importance of the different networks. So to upweigh, for example, the yeah. less noisy ones or... Um... Yeah, so it's something we did. So, um, so we did that for the community identification, but also here we can see that when we do the leave one out cross validation. So it's not presented here. But here I compare the protein-protein interaction with the multiplex. But in fact, we did compare protein-protein interaction with co-expression, with pathway. And the, for, for predicting gene disease association, the, better, the best network was protein-protein interaction. And in second pathway, and then co-expression. So we have that in, in the first uh, uh, random work with restart paper comparing the, the different networks. And what is interesting is that the co-expression network was very bad to predict gene disease association, but still when combined with the protein-protein interaction network, it was increasing the prediction of the protein-protein interaction network. So it means that it still contained a, a slight bit of signal there. I see, thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Are there 
further questions. And I have a higher level question, namely, in, in what you presented, and there's a bit linked to what Giovanni just asked, um, in, in, these, in, in many of these approaches, there are a lot of parameters to be set. And you also refer to uh, the, the, the very popular task of node embedding, so, which is often done with deep learning these days. So which role for deep learning do you see in this, um, in this field? Um, can, you, can you maybe distinguish here between scenarios where you think it might be useful, scenarios where you think it might not be useful? Um, so so how, how important is deep learning in this context? Um, yeah, it's quite a high level question indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, indeed uh, for, for, yeah, we have the graph convolutional networks that are kind of network embedding, uh, just another strategy. Here we do not have so big data set. So it's not what we used uh, so far, even if combining different interaction sources, we start to have some, yeah, computational difficulties. Um, but the, the main project we have that are related to deep learning is that when now we want to integrate uh, the different omics data with images. And I think uh, at this, and so one very fancy work is the work from Caroline Huller in, in the US where they have these auto encoders and different omics and images on single cell. And they try to project everything in the same dimensional space. And it's something we would like to try uh, with uh, data. We have multi-omics data, so it's bulk, but multi-omics data and images um, for these muscle cells and uh, contracting with calcium fluxes. So it, it's what we, what we will try to do, but I would like to be sure first if the autoencoders are better than matrix factorization to project or to reduce the dimension of omics data, I'm not completely sure. There, there are some, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe because it's nonlinear and this kind of thing, but we will have to test that. And in that's fact, we have a project. That's a classic network mm. problem, right? So, so now- So that, that was more for the omics. Is, yeah, mm. it's more multi omics, I see. I see. Yeah, it, it's more on, on this question here. And, and we would like to try to compare matrix factorization and auto encoders for the same task. And yeah, see that makes a lot of sense. Yes, yes. Mm. I see the potential there with the graphs and the networks. It's always the question: Do is there enough data to do to do? Yeah, this, for right? the for the graph right now, I, I didn't see, and in particular because the random walk with restart is really efficient. So it, yeah. it's it's really cheap. We, we can compute it. So I, I don't know, and it's something we want to compare the network embedding to the direct uh, random walk with restart because uh, okay, the, the embedding is costly, and and so. What exactly type of additional signal or filtering does it bring on the table? And it's what we have to compare now. Hmm. No, makes a lot of sense, yes. So I also find it much harder to see the, the deep learning application here in the graph domain than in the dimensionality reduction domain. Yeah, I think, I think it's right much now it's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there further questions? Let me just check the. The chat, we, but we are also at the end of this um, one hour. Thank you very much, Anais, for this excellent presentation. Also, very, very uh, thought provoking about uh, the future of, of uh, biological network analysis and dimensionality reduction. I enjoyed this very much. Uh, so, we again um, send you a round of applause here. And uh, we are also grateful that you are taking now another half an hour to meet our doctoral students of the network. This will be in a breakout room. But okay. the other PIs and myself, we say goodbye here. Thank you very much. That was great. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao.